As most of us already know, some of the members of the American Mafia have been known for their treachery and greed, using murder as one of their main tools in order to take what they want, as well as a means to keep their freedom if they merely suspected someone to be cooperating against them. As a result, certain guys would go on to rack up an absurd number of bodies during their time in Cosa Nostra. While some men only use killing as a means to advance in the life and make money, there's a select number of other men who seem to enjoy killing, and in some cases even dismembering their victims, racking up body counts in the hundreds. In this video, we're going to talk about both types of men and highlight certain individuals who seem to have an abnormal number of victims as compared to their fellow members in that life, some which you're familiar with and others who may have flown a little bit more under the radar. September 20th, 1932. The first guy we're going to take a look at is New England Patriarcha crime family enforcer, Joseph the Animal Barboza. Barboza is said to have lived up to his nickname The Animal because of his vicious and cold-blooded style as a debt collector for the Patriarcha crime family. It's been said that he once chewed off a piece of a man's cheek and ear and spit it out during a fight, and once gnawed on a piece of a man's skull that was blown off after shooting him. In a television interview done by Barboza in 1970, Barboza was quoted saying, I'd stab guys after 14 weeks who still continued to hide, speaking on men who were trying to avoid paying debts, also stating, you know I'd stab them in the face, I'd stab them in the legs, I'd stab them in the arms, I'd stab them in the chest, all while maintaining a very calm and laid back demeanor. In the 1960s, the Patriarchs would align with their smaller Providence, Rhode Island family with independent mobsters and Irish gangsters during the bloody and deadly McLean-McLaughlin gang war in Boston and would recruit the 34-year-old Joseph the Animal Barboza as an enforcer, which the Patriarchs desperately needed at the time. According to Barboza, he killed 26 out of the 50 people who were whacked during the war that lasted more than three years. As a result of the work Barboza put in for the Patriarchs, they were able to regain control of the street <clears throat> and dominate some of the underworld rackets. In 1996, police would pull over Barboza and uncover an arsenal of weapons. He would be arrested on gun charges and hit with a $100,000 bail. Barboza expected his boss Raymond Patriarca to pay his bail, but Patriarca refused. It's also said that Barboza's associates raised $80,000 out of $100,000, but Patriarcha killed three of the men and even took over Barboza's loan sharking racket as well as the money. Upon learning about his boss's betrayal, Barboza would flip and begin cooperating with the FBI, and in exchange, Barboza would be granted immunity for his crimes. Barboza's cooperation would put away multiple gangsters, including his former boss, but it would later come out that in one of the biggest miscarriages of justice ever by the FBI, that the FBI agents overseeing Barboza, along with the director of the FBI, J. Edgar Hoover's knowledge, were allowing Barboza to commit perjury under oath, as well as helping him frame numerous mobsters for crimes that were knowingly committed by other people. The House Committee on Government Reform would acknowledge this miscarriage of justice in 2002, but nothing would change. Barboza and the FBI agent together framed a man for a murder actually committed by Barboza. Then in 1970, Barboza was sent to Santa Rosa in the Witness Protection Program, where he would meet a man named Clay Wilson, who claimed to have valuables and money hidden from burglaries he committed, and Barboza wanted a piece of the stash. Wilson would take Barboza to the money, and while walking with Wilson and two females, the animal pulled out a gun and killed Wilson and then buried his body under a tree stone. Barboza would be arrested for this murder, but the agents in charge of Barboza in Boston would fly to California and testify as character witnesses on his behalf, as well as U.S. attorney from Boston who showed up to testify too. Barboza would use the fact that the FBI told him to lie as leverage against the agents by threatening to retract his testimony that the feds created to help put Patriarcha away. So with the feds help, Barboza would only receive five years to life on a reduced second degree murder charge. After his release in 1975, Barboza would be shot down by a shotgun blast on orders from Patriarcha. Harry 
Pittsburgh Phil Strauss. Pittsburgh Phil was an enforcer for Murder Inc., which was a Brownsville, Brooklyn based gang of certified killers who would take murder contracts for all of the five families in New York between the 1930s and 1940s, as well as control and run rackets of their own throughout the five boroughs. Strauss was born in Brooklyn, July 28, 1909, and started his criminal career early on, causing him to be arrested 17 times before he was 25 years old, but was never convicted of any of his crimes. Strauss was said to have used multiple weapons, including an ice pick, a knife, and carried a gun, because he liked to have options to choose from when he was killing his targets. When Strauss linked up with Murder, Inc., he would become a full-blown assassin and would sometimes be sent on out-of-town missions, including the infamous hit on Harry Millman, a member of the Detroit Purple Gang. It's reported that Strauss was responsible for over 100 murders, and some historians have even said his number of victims could be as high as 500 victims. On top of his variety of weapons, Strauss is said to have strangled, drowned, and buried some of his victims alive. According to other sources, they claim Strauss actually never carried a weapon in case he was stopped by police, but would instead scout the area he was at and use whatever objects or means necessary to complete his kills. Pittsburgh Phil once told a friend when talking about his career as a contract killer that it was like being a ball player. I start with these jobs and get seasoned until someone from the big league scouts me, which is exactly what happened when he was recognized by men like Lucky Luciano, Albert Anastasia, Joe Adonis, and Louis Lepke of Murder, Inc., and soon would become known as one of the most prolific killers of them all. In one murder Strauss was hired to do, him and some of his crew lured Puggy Feinstein to a house where Strauss pushed him onto a couch and began stabbing him with an ice pick. Puggy, in an attempt to escape, bit Strauss' finger to which he replied by taking a rope and tying it around his neck and taking another rope, tying around his feet and in some way eventually causing Feinstein to strangle himself to death. The men then took his body to a vacant lot and set it on fire. Following the job, the men would go celebrate with the seafood dinner in Sheepshead Bay, Brooklyn. Harry Pittsburgh Phil Strauss became so popular among the gangster underworld that when out-of-town families needed a job done, they would request Strauss. It said Strauss would pack a pair of underwear, socks, and a t-shirt, along with his ice pick, rope, knife, and gun, and would take a train or plane to do his job and catch the next connecting ride back to New York City. Most of the time, Strauss didn't even know the name of his targets. Upon the bust of Murder, Inc. in 1940, Brooklyn District Attorney would tie Pittsburgh Phil Strauss with strong evidence to 28 murders. Strauss would eventually be ratted out by fellow Murder, Inc. member Abe Reels, who would end up being tossed out of a Brooklyn hotel window or being guarded by an inefficient police guard. But the damage had already been done. Strauss would be sent to the electric chair, and Harry Pittsburgh Phil Strauss would take his last breath at 11.06 p.m. on June 12, 1941. Thomas Tommy Karate Pater Tommy Karate was an enforcer for the Bonanno crime family who started as a soldier and rose to become captain of his own crew and was suspected to have murdered 60 people according to law enforcement. Pater is infamous for taking out John Gotti's longtime friend turned informant Willie Boy Johnson but is also well known for his ruthlessness during his time with the Bananos. Patera's style of killing was cynical and evil, and he was known for using the National Wildlife Refuge in Staten Island as his own personal graveyard because he believed that the wet soil would help his victims' bodies decompose quicker. Police would eventually find six of Patera's victims buried there with their heads chopped off and buried separately from the bodies in an attempt to throw police off from identifying them through dental records. Patera, born December 2, 1954 in Gravesend, Brooklyn, was said to have been a victim of being bullied and was often beat up and abused, which is believed to be a major contributor to Patera's sadistic and violent behavior as an adult. In junior high school, Patera would enroll in karate classes and begin studying the craft, helping build his confidence back up 
and in 1964, Patera entered a karate tournament where he would destroy all seven of his competitors and win a year-long scholarship to study the martial art in Japan. While in Japan, Patera would work for a chopstick factory and was said to have been studying the history of the samurai warriors. Patera, who would soon learn the nickname Tommy Karate because of his love for the martial arts after his return to New York City in 1976. Growing up in Gravesend, Karate, like a lot of neighborhood kids, grew up surrounded by wise guys in social clubs and looked up to the mobsters. So when Karate ran into Banano Hitman, Anthony Bruno and Delicato at a local bar, the two men quickly became acquainted. Karate would begin working for Indelicato, who was a prevalent member of the Bonanno crime family, an active drug dealer. Dealing and delivering drugs for his new friend, Karate, would eventually graduate to smuggling drugs into the U.S. from Canada, and would also become a debt collector for various members of the Bonanno family. Using his martial arts skills and muscular physique to beat up and instill fear into anyone the Bonanno family felt was trying to stiff the gangsters out of money. Upon learning his new business partner was a contract killer for the family, Patera's interest would be piqued and it said Karate then began studying the art of killing and dismembering victims. Police would later find books in Karate's apartment that would teach him how to murder, dissect, cut, and mutilate his victims' bodies, as well as books teaching Patera the best ways to make a body disappear. Patera would make his bones in the Mafia by killing Wilford Willie Boy Johnson, a Gambino associate and longtime close friend to Gambino boss John Gotti, after it was revealed Johnson had been informing on Gotti and his brothers for over 20 years. Patera was given the contract in the form of an envelope with Willie Boy's name and picture inside. August 29, 1988. Wilford Willie Boy Johnson would be hit with a barrage of gunfire outside of his Brooklyn home while walking to his car. Tommy Karate, alongside another banana enforcer, Vincent Gojack Giatino, would shoot Johnson 19 times from point blank range, hitting him in the head, back, and thighs. Following the hit, Karate would be introduced to former banana consigliere Anthony Spiro, who would sponsor Patera to officially become a made man and Karate would be assigned a crew of drug dealers, and Karate would begin kicking up to the family. Patera's second hit would be a man named Thomas Salerno, who was a drug dealer that would often be laid on payment to the family. Patera was said to have murdered Salerno and then parked his car near the Gravesend Bridge to send a message to the other neighborhood dealers not to play with Tommy Karate. Patera's third murder would be one that would show Patera's ruthlessness when he decided to murder a woman named Phyllis Birdie. Birdie would be shot in her sleep in the apartment of her boyfriend, Frank Ganji, after Karate's girlfriend, Celeste Lapari, overdosed and died while partying with Birdie. Karate started seeing Birdie after his divorce from his wife in the early 1980s. The two were said to be a good couple, except for the fact Celeste was a drug addict. Karate was said to have chased down, beat up, and threatened all of Celeste's drug dealers in his attempt to get her clean, but Lapari would get around the problem by instead having her friend Phyllis Birdie buy the drugs for her, and the two would party together behind Tommy's back after he warned the two women to stop hanging out. On September 10, 1987, Birdie and Lapari began partying, doing cocaine together in a Brooklyn bar, and would end up back at Phyllis's apartment. Celeste, who was now coming down from the coke, would shoot up heroin to fall asleep, but that would be Celeste's last shot after she fell asleep and never woke up. Frank Ganji, who informed Karate of Celeste's death, would begin hanging out with Phyllis, who was Karate deemed responsible for Celeste's death. On September 30th, Ganji met Phyllis at a bar where the two would party until taking the party back to Ganji's apartment where the two are said to have did drugs and have sex for two days before Ganji informed Karate Phyllis was with them at the apartment. Karate told Ganji to keep her there where he would then go over to the apartment, shoot Phyllis while she was asleep, dismember her body, cut off her head, and stuff the six separate body parts into two different suitcases before taking the head and putting it in his freezer. 
Patera would have his crew bury Phil Slapari's body in his personal graveyard located at the Wildlife Bird Sanctuary in Staten Island, where years later, law enforcement would dig up six bodies reported to have been put there by karate. Not long after a birdie incident where Frank Gangy set Phyllis up for Tommy to come in and blow her brains out and then sever her head, it said Gangy started having second thoughts about his life in the mob. So when he was pulled over and arrested for a DUI, once he got to the precinct, he started singing to a detective he knew. Ganji would flip and become an informant, and his first order of business would be none other than Tommy Karate, telling police everything he knew. Patera was believed to have killed 30 people, with some of the more notable being obviously Willie Boy Johnson, who we covered earlier. Then you have Talal Sakik, a drug dealer Karate shot at point blank range, leaving him for dead inside a Brooklyn apartment because Karate believed the man was a police informant. Ganji was present for the hit and said that beforehand the two had stopped at another crew member's house, Richard David, to get the gun and the silencer, as well as a suitcase, a hacksaw, and plastic bags. Then you have Phyllis Birdie, who were already covered. And then Marek Kacharski was stabbed by karate before Ganji got his hands on him and slit his throat over an insult. Ganji and karate also took out Joseph Bozano because Karate lost trust in him, so they invited him to dinner, where Ganji stabbed him with an ice pick before Tommy finished him off with a shot to the back of the head. Those are just some of the ruthless and violent murders committed by Patera. Thank you for watching part one of the Mafia's most ruthless and violent killers. Stay tuned for part two, where we'll be covering another three mobsters and some of the more heinous acts committed by members of Cosa I always wanted to be a gangster. Wise guys.